So in the previous video, we saw that no matter what context we encounter them in, in topology, if I have a continuous function and a compact subset of that function's domain, then the image of that compact subset will be a compact subset of the range of my function. So continuous functions take compact sets to compact sets in their forward image. And this seems like a relatively abstruse result that we might not otherwise care about. But we'll see in this video that when we apply that very result to the case of subsets of the real line with the standard topology that we usually use to measure the distances between two real numbers using the absolute value of their difference, what falls out of that result immediately is the thing that makes optimization problems in calculus possible to begin with. It's a result called the extreme value theorem. And despite the fact that it tends not to show up until your calculus course, it doesn't actually have anything to do with derivatives or anything else that people usually associate with calculus. In this video, we'll show that all that we need is continuity and a compact subset of the domain. Here's how it works. Let's think about what it would take to make optimization problems possible in calculus. What are we trying to do? We're trying to look for functions that have what I call the extreme value property. And what I mean by the extreme value property is we would like for it to be possible to write an optimization problem for the function that we're interested in on the domain on which we're interested in it. In other words, we want to be able to tell somebody, hey, find the global maximum and the global minimum value of this function on the domain that we specify. And whether or not this is possible probably depends on a lot of factors. In particular, if you give me a function whose graph looks like this mess over here, so it's got kind of a lot of weird stuff going on, then we could have some stuff that happens that makes this kind of hard to do. For example, if the domain that you give me is this subset of the x-axis down here, right, then I may be able to identify a global maximum value for the function on that domain. But I don't know if this thing is cratering down to a, a vertical asymptote where the function approaches minus infinity right here, then there isn't going to be a minimum value at all anywhere on this particular domain. And so that would probably not be the kind of question that I'd want to pose. Similarly, if I pick this domain over here, I'll be able to identify a minimum value, a global minimum, on that domain. But if I look for a global maximum, I'll probably try to look at the very top of this piece of the graph. The problem is this piece of graph doesn't really have a top. It's got this little open circle up here. So even though it looks like there's kind of a maximum value, like the values of this function are in fact bounded from above, this maximal value is not actually attained as a value of f of c for any c in my domain. So there is a maximum, there's an upper bound, therefore there's a least upper bound, if you like. But that upper bound is not the value of f of c for any c in my domain. So it's not what we call attained. If I'm writing an optimization problem, find the global maximum and minimum, I want the maximum and minimum values of the function to actually be attainable as values of f for inputs that belong to the domain that I'm asking about. And so there's a couple things that we probably want to insist on if we want to make our, our job possible in optimization. First, we probably want to insist on continuity. Otherwise, if we have discontinuity, we can have this kind of behavior happen over here, where I get a jump discontinuity at a point, and that jump can sort of make this maximum not attainable or make a minimum not attainable or something like that. So let's insist on continuity. That is a lot to ask, but it's not really calculus, right? We're not insisting there be derivatives or anything like that yet. And we also probably want to insist that the domain that we're asking about doesn't have any gaps in it. Right? If I have a vertical asymptote in my function, then there's going to be a little gap in the domain of that function where that vertical asymptote resides. And so I probably want there not to be any gaps in the domain as well. So I should insist that my domain is an interval. Remember a few videos ago, we defined the concept of interval as a subset of the real line in which if you give me any two points that are different, uh, that are members of that set, then every real number in between those numbers also belongs to that same set. In other words, a set has no gaps in between any two of its numbers. So we should probably insist that f is continuous, and we should probably insist that the domain is an interval. But here's an example of a domain which is an interval, and we can see that a minimal value is attained here, but the maximum value, even though we can point out exactly where it is, that maximum value is also not attained by f of c for any C that belongs to my interval because I haven't included this endpoint and this maximum value appears to occur at one of the endpoints of my domain. After all, when you do optimization problems in calculus, that's usually the recipe that you follow, right? 
check for whether there's a maximum or minimum value on the interior of the of the set, and then manually go and check the left hand and the right hand endpoints to see if the maximum and minimum might occur at one of those. And so we should probably also make sure that our domain is not only an interval, but an interval that contains both of its endpoints. Otherwise, if the max or min happens at one of those endpoints, we're not going to be able to attain it. So hopefully I've kind of talked us into a situation where we want to have a continuous function and we want to have a domain which is a interval that contains both of those endpoints. So it looks like a closed interval from A to B. So that's going to be the kind of domain that we're going to study here. And we'll say that a function has the extreme value property on that closed bounded interval from A to B. If there is a minimal value, I'm going to call it lowercase m, which is equal to the minimal value of the f of x's, the minimum y value, if you like, for all x values on the domain from A to B. So in this picture, that little m would be this value on the y-axis, which is the y value of my global minimum point, which in this case happens to happen somewhere inside of my interval. But remember, we not only want that minimal value to exist, we also want that minimal value to be attained by the function. In other words, there should be an input value, an x value, that's a part of my domain for which f of that input gives me my minimum value. And so we want there to be a c in my domain, such that f of c is equal to lowercase m. So f has the extreme value property if it attains its minimum value as a point that is in the domain of the function, and also that the same is true of the maximal value. The maximal y value for this function over all x values in my domain exists and is also attained as f of d for some d in my interval. In this particular picture, I've sort of drawn it as though the minimal value is attained at an x value, c, which is interior to my domain, but that the maximal value is attained at this right-hand endpoint, so it's attained at a boundary point of my domain. So in this case, it's the right-hand endpoint of the closed interval from A to B. So we want both of those possibilities to be included. So f has the extreme value property. If a maximum and minimum value for the function exist, and also that those values are attained as values of the function for input values that belong to my domain. So the big question for us is, do we have a sufficient set of criteria here for this extreme value property to happen? Is it true that every continuous function on a interval from A to B, which includes both of its endpoints, will have this extreme value property, and therefore we can give a calculus student this problem and say, find the global maximum and minimum, and know that a solution to that optimization problem exists at all and is possible? Is this a sufficient set of criteria? And fortunately for us, the answer is yes. If f is a continuous function on a domain E, then it will have the extreme value property on any interval, a to b, including the endpoints, which is a subset of the domain. And this is a theorem that in your calculus textbook you probably, well, maybe you remember, maybe you don't, is called the extreme value theorem. And again, it's in your calculus textbook because it has something to do with continuous functions, which have something to do with limits. But it doesn't have anything to do with derivatives, even though in optimization problems in calculus, usually the first thing students remember is, oh, I should take a derivative and set it equal to 0 and solve for x. Because what are you looking for? You're looking for local maximum and minimum points, which we don't have in our analysis course yet a vocabulary to talk about. But we don't need to in order to establish the extreme value theorem that makes optimization possible. All we need is continuity on the closed interval from A to B. So let's do our due diligence. Why? Is this a sufficient set of criteria? How do we get this extreme value property for a continuous function on the closed interval from A to B? So there's two things about the closed interval from A to B that are important. And the first one is that the closed interval from A to B is an interval. For any two numbers, real numbers, a, uh, uh, any two real numbers that you pick in that set, every number in between them also is an element of that set. And so if you remember from a couple of videos ago, that makes it a connected subset of the real line. And a few videos ago, we established that continuous functions take connected subsets of the domain to connected subsets of the range. And so f of the interval from a to b will also be a connected set. It will be a connected subset of the codomain, of the range of my function. And because there is no difference between connected sets and intervals when it comes to the real number line and the standard topology, that means that f of the closed interval from a to b is an interval. If we call the interval from A to B here the domain of my function, typically we'll call F of 
the closed interval from A to B. We'll call that the range of F. So my domain is a interval that contains both of its endpoints, and now we know that the range is also an interval that contains both of its endpoints. Well, we don't know that piece yet. Right. And so to know that, we have to do something else. There's another thing that's important about the domain, the closed interval from A to B. It is a set which is bounded, because A and B are both finite real numbers, but it's also closed because it contains both of those endpoints. We established way back when that closed intervals in the standard topology on the real line are an important example of closed sets. We could also test that that set contains all of its accumulation points. We could also test that its complement is an open set in the standard topology. However you do it, you will recognize that this is a closed and bounded subset of the real numbers. But according to our heine borel theorem, that makes it a compact subset of the real numbers. Because heine borel tells us in the real numbers with the standard topology, there is no difference between compactness, in other words, cover finiteness, subsequent completeness, and closeness and boundedness in combination. And one video ago, we established that continuous functions take compact subsets of the domain to compact subsets of the range. And so therefore, the range of this function will also be a compact set. And applying heine borel one more time, that means that the range of this function is also a closed and bounded set. So knowing what we know about how continuous functions interact with connected sets and how continuous functions interact with compact sets is enough to guarantee for us that because the domain of my function is a closed bounded interval, the range of my function will also be a closed bounded interval. What do closed bounded intervals on the real number line look like? They look like closed intervals from some minimal value to some maximal value, both of which are finite. We'll call them little m and big M, suggestively. So the range of my function is a closed interval between two real numbers, little m and big M. And what does that mean, that the range is that closed interval? Just by definition of the image of a set, it means that there exist a C and a D in my domain such that f of C is equal to little m because little m is contained in the image, and f of D is equal to big M because big M is contained in my image. And that's the proof. So there's the extreme value theorem. This is what makes optimization problems in calculus possible. As long as you give me a continuous function and a closed bounded interval on which to look for a global minimum and maximum value, then I will be able to find a global minimum and maximum value. Now, I might not be able to find it analytically without using some of the tools of calculus, but I can be guaranteed that that global minimum and maximum exist and that they are attained by values of the function for inputs in the domain that you gave me. So the shorthand for this result is, I usually think of it as continuous functions on compact domains attain their maximum and minimum values. Continuous functions on compact domains attain their maximum and minimum values. This is one of those, I said it twice because it's doubly important. We're going to end up using this result an awful lot as we go forward because having a maximum and a minimum value for something is really useful in analysis. Right? Um, if we're trying to get bounds for an estimate and a proof or something like that. Very often we run into problems where we say, well, how do we know that this thing doesn't just blow up to infinity? Or how do we know that it stays away from zero or something like that? And if I'm able to invoke a result like this, well, there's a maximum and a minimum value and both of those are attained, that can really help me to know that I have a lot more control over the function than I might otherwise uh, be worried that I might not have. So continuous functions attaining a maximum and minimum value on every compact domain is a big deal. It doesn't just make the calculus enjoyer happy because it's going to make all of his optimization problems on his homework possible. Right? It's also going to be a valuable tool for us as we get more into the weeds on how continuous functions work, where continuous functions come from, what are some special kinds of continuous functions that we can study in analysis, especially some that have relationships to calculus ideas that we like. Um, and everything else from here forward. We're going to refer back to this result an awful lot. And this is where it came from. This is why we built up so much of those topological properties early in the course, is that once we knew how continuous functions interacted with open sets, then we could figure out how they interacted with connected sets. Then we could figure out how they interacted with compact sets. And we needed both how it interacted with connected and compact sets in order to establish this result right here that we know as the extreme value theorem. So where we're going next with this, before we move uh, forward into derivatives and calculus, is we're going to look at one more what's called extremal property of continuous functions. Continuous functions on compact domains actually have one more really 
helpful, useful property called uniform continuity, which in the beginning doesn't seem like it's very interesting or important, but it's an example of the kind of thinking that we're going to increasingly do in analysis as we move forward. So in the next couple of videos, we're going to take a look at uniformly continuous functions and why they give us a little bit nicer flavor of continuity than just your sort of garden variety continuous functions.